I got up this morning and uh, I just had this sense. I, I don't, we don't have a TV where we live. And I thought, well, maybe Robert Schuler's on. I'll see what he's up to. And I turned it on and there was the Crystal Cathedral. And they were singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. It was like straightforward hymn. It was a uh, reference to the cross and to the blood. And anybody watching would think, hey, what's, what's, what's the problem with Robert Schuler? I mean, he's, he's saying all the right things. Well, the problem is, Timothy was told by Paul and warned about those with double tongues. Uh, the old Westerns, they used to call it, and the uh, Native Americans used to call it forked tongues. Uh, in the book of James, it's double-mindedness. And uh, David referred to those with a double heart. I don't say this lightly about Robert Schuller, but the man should not be on television representing the Lord. And I think one of the signs of the times is the fact that the men who call themselves our Christian leaders are not doing anything about it. They, they think that by saying, oh yeah, Robert Schuller, he's a heretic or whatever, that somehow that covers them. The man is going out to upwards of, I, I guess, 20 million people. Last I heard, it was all 50 states and into Muslim countries, into Russia. Um, it's unbelievable. And what, if you can appreciate this, the man who introduced me to A Course in Miracles, and I'll describe The Course in Miracles, it's the Bible upside down. It's the closest thing to a New Age Bible that uh, is out there. It's what Oprah has been pushing since 1992 through Marianne Williamson. This Course in Miracles was introduced to me by a man by the name of Gerald Jampolsky, a psychiatrist. And he's been one of the foremost New Age leaders with The Course in Miracles, and his endorsement is on Robert Schuller's latest book. And Robert Schuller had Gerald Jampolsky on his Hour of Power way back in 19, the early 1980s when his book, Love, Jampolsky's book, Love is Letting Go of Fear, came out. That's the book that I read. And in that book, he said, everything in this book came from A Course in Miracles. It was like, kind of like, a, it's kind of like the shack. It kind of, it's a bridge to other things. And what did he talk about in that little book, Love is Letting Go of Fear? He talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. I mean, forgiveness is an important part of the Christian faith. And what they do is they introduce these concepts, but then they have new definitions. The Course of Miracles says that you forgive your brother and your sister for not recognizing that they're God. That's, that's the new perception. That's the new paradigm. The new, the new paradigm, the new worldview, is re the new perception is recognizing that God is in everyone. It's interesting in the responsive reading today from Romans 12, 1 to 8, verse 5, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. This is at the heart of the Course in Miracles because they misuse that, and they say that all of humanity is the body of Christ. All of humanity is the body of God. And that it, I've, I've given this example before, I think, at, at this church. It's like the... White House Christmas tree, when they throw the switch and all the lights go on. And you remember when you were a kid, or maybe, I don't know, maybe they still have that problem, but when we were kids, if one light bulb didn't work, it short-circuited the whole tree. Well, guess what? Those who do not believe that they are a cell in the body of humanity, in the body of God, are said to short-circuit the thriving ability of the body of Christ, which is humanity. Now, who would that be? It would be those who refuse to recognize that they are God. That would be us. They even have a process laid out where those people who they call cancer cells, Barbara Marks Hubbard is saying that she received this from Christ, obviously the Antichrist spirit, that those who refuse are like cancer cells in the body of humanity and they need to be healed or eliminated. Now, when John was delivering his message this morning, I, I felt that the, the Holy Spirit was here in a powerful way, and I was sitting there going, I even said to Greg, I said, you sure you want me to go last? I mean, it's like the Holy Spirit would have sent him right out the door flying with that sermon this morning, and you know, my talk, you know, people might be going in a low crawl, you know, hey, thanks a lot, Warren, that was, that was a great message. Hope we don't see you for a while. <laughs> but I think we need to be encouraged 
that the Lord told us, Behold, I have told you before. I've told you ahead of time. Why? So you won't be offended. Things are happening right now, and, and some of us that are speaking these things are, are feeling the force that's coming against, not us, but God's word. And it's gonna, you're going to feel it too. You probably already do. It's called persecution. Those that are finding fault with us are saying we have a persecution complex. Well, it seems to me that our Lord said, blessed are those that are persecuted, so I don't think it's too wrong to, to feel like you're being persecuted when in reality you are. The selection process is there. Uh, it's not just Barbara Marks Hubbard and her Christ. It's the New Age Christ, but the New Age is no longer calling itself the New Age. Why? Because people exposed it. Christian authors like Constance Cumby, Dave Hunt, Johanna Michelson, and others brought the New Age into the light starting in, in the early uh, to mid-80s, and it kind of moved through to the early 90s. My book, The Light That Was Dark, was written in 1992. Publishers were saying, shortly after my book was published by Moody Press, they were saying, well, the New Age is passe. Uh, it's not really where we want the publishing interest to be. And I think my publisher, Moody Press, got me one interview for my book. One interview was with Moody Broadcasting. And I was grateful for that, but I, I, I felt like the Lord was saying, Warren, if you're going to talk about these things, if you want to get your book out and the information that's in it out to people, you're going to have to do it yourself because you're not going to get much help from the Christian establishment. By the way, the New Age was moving into full gear at that time. That was a complete misunderstanding on their part. Uh, the New Age was doing anything but going away, but they were starting to label themselves differently. They were starting to call it the new gospel and the new spirituality. You're going to hear that term a lot more because a lot of the emerging church leaders are using that term new spirituality. There's a new paradigm. You're going to hear more about that. And ultimately, I believe from what I'm hearing that we're going to move into what is going to be called a new world view. I'm hearing that word an awful lot. Um, Rick Warren in his latest Purpose Driven Connection magazine has a DVD where he sits with Chuck Colson and they talk about the biblical worldview. And a lot of it sounds just fine. And then you wonder, what is Chuck Colson doing on, on stage with Robert Schuller at a Rethink conference in 2008 lauding Robert Schuller? There's, th there's this double-tongued, double-minded approach where when some of these guys are cornered with the hypocrisy of what they're doing, they, they whip up a Bible scripture or they, or they bring out something that they said in a sermon or a talk somewhere, and you have to know that you, you can't do that. You cannot serve two masters. You can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Well, why am I saying that Robert Schuller is double-tongued besides the fact that he has endorsed? He had, <laughs> this, was, this was the most amazing thing to me. When my book, Deceived on Purpose, came out in 2004 in August, warning about Gerald Jampolsky and the relationship with Robert Schuller, two months later, Robert Schuller had Gerald Jampolsky as his featured guest on his program, and it recommended all of his books, said, God bless you, as he left, and uh, I, I was stunned. I mean, it was like, where are our Christian leaders? I mean, I, I've, you know, barked out my warning, and, and, you know, for whatever it's worth, but I mean, Somebody in leadership could just take care of this very quickly by exposing it, bringing it to light. It's not happening, and I think that's part of the problem. And here's, here's how I see the big picture. Have you ever seen those drawings where you look at it, and there's like configurations, and if you look a particular way, you can see a chalice. And if you look another way, you can see an old woman with a, with a scarf on. Some of you have probably seen that. And Usually at first you only see one, and then when you keep looking you go, oh yeah, there's the other one. What the enemy is trying to do is they're trying to take that picture of Christ that's in the Bible, and they're trying to flip your way of seeing it so that you have a new perception and a new way of connecting the dots and seeing another Christ. It's 2 Corinthians 11.4. When Paul chided the Corinthians and he said, if another Jesus with another gospel, another spirit, comes through here, you might just go along with it. It's happening. It's happening. There's a, there's a new Christ 
There's a new spirituality, a new worldview being created as we, as we speak, and it's been working. You know, the enemy came, sowed the tares among the wheat, and I, I've been in this faith now, it's going to be 25 years in June, and I've watched the New Age from the day that I came across because I knew what it was. It's done nothing but grow exponentially over the years. A lot of people are saying, how did this happen? How did everything get so bad all of a sudden? Well, we saw the way it was working through the years, and part of it was pastors were not declaring the whole counsel of God. They were leaving out discernment, spiritual discernment. They were leaving out the warnings about what was going on. So it looked fine because they're proclaiming, you know, the Lord, the cross, you know, repent, baptize to some extent, different pastors in different ways, but they weren't warning. So this thing just kept building and building. The crucial time was September 11th, 2001. I had been uh, led to leave my job as a hospice social worker and to uh, go down to Louisiana uh, to write a book about the coming false Christ. Got there in August, started doing a little bit of research, and September 11th hit. And all of a sudden, a lot of the people that I was researching in the New Age were showing up on TV, on Oprah, on uh, Good Morning America, uh, Larry King, and they were saying, you know what? It's a new world, and we, we need a new way. Our way hasn't worked. Uh, what irony, what irony that these New Age leaders are presenting themselves kind of as, when they're saying our way, they're, they're obviously speaking of the, the Christian way. And they're saying we need a new way of looking at things. Neil Donald Walsh, New Age leader, said we need a new God. We need a new spirituality. We don't need the old spirituality. Brian McLaren says much the same thing when he says the old story is an old, old story. We need a new, new story. We need a new framing story. That's where the shack comes in. The shack comes in as a bridge. Robert Shuler has been a bridge. He's been leeching on through television for years, and he's had an amazing string of people who have New Age sympathies, affections, or in Jan Polsky's case, he's out and out one of the top New Age leaders. He's the reason that I got as in deeply involved in The Course of Miracles as I did. Let me just, uh, for those who aren't familiar with The Course of Miracles, uh, it came through a woman, a psychologist in New York City by the name of Helen Schuchman. She heard a voice in the mid-60s that said, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. The voice reputedly was Jesus. That's who he said he was. She wasn't so sure, but she took everything down for like seven years. Here are some of the teachings that this Jesus gave her. There's no separation of God and his creation. Remember yesterday I was talking about the capital C creation in the shack to over 20 times? That's God and his creation. There's no separation of God and his creation. The recognition of God is the recognition of yourself. That's the bottom line of the new spirituality. God is in everyone and everything. Robert Schuller, in 2003 on the Hour of Power said, God is not only transcendent out there, he is imminent. Yes, God is alive and he is in every single human being. Meanwhile, they're all singing, you know, all hell, power in Jesus' name this morning with a beautiful chorus. They had a, they had a guy that played uh, a song after that that was, you know, could, it was straight out of the gospel and it was beautiful. I mean, you know, Buck and I would have sat there and said, hey, that guy's pretty good. People are getting all revved up with these biblical terms, just like I did with the Course of Miracles, because Jesus was there, the Holy Spirit was there, God was there, just like in the shack. You know, if you don't know the Bible, Luke eleven twenty eight, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Keep it. The Stony Ground Christians had a lot of enthusiasm. They loved the Lord. And it says during affliction, tribulation, persecution, and then in Luke, in times of temptation, they fell away. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The new age is nothing but seducing spirits, like the one that came through Helen Schuchman, delivering doctrines of devils. The Bible hit it on the nose. When Johanna Michelson, at the end of her book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, when she just started going through scripture, I sat on the floor of this bookstore, and I just couldn't believe it. I just went, whoa. You know, I mean, is it possible that, that we are part of something that the Bible warned about? 
And, and, and I think I've mentioned this before here. As I was reading this book, and it was opening my eyes, uh, a homeless mentally ill guy that I'd seen on the street before came into the bookstore, came over to where I was reading on the floor and taking notes, and he said, are you going to buy that book? What are you doing with that book? Are you going to buy that book? And I just clutched the book to my chest, and I went, oh, goodness, does, does, this, does evil know that I'm reading about it? And the answer is yes. There's a spirit world that's highly orchestrated. Ephesians 6 lays it out. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, you know what? Those high places are churches that aren't discerning and let people get to the level of people like Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller's a wolf in sheep's clothing, and there's no doubt about it. You cannot say that God is in everything. Have someone like Gerald Jampolsky. By the way, Gerald Jampolsky is a really nice guy. I mean, he, he's very caring, much like Oprah. When I was in the New Age, I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't like... A, a nasty person. I was a social worker. I was helping the homeless. I was helping people. But we had upside down doctrine. We had wrong definitions. But Robert Schuller, he knows what he's doing. He, he's, he's going both ways. So when he starts to get the spotlight on him, he backs off. He stops his Institute for Successful Church Leadership because that's where a lot of this came in. That's where Rick Warren, you know, he was a, Schuller said that Rick Warren was a graduate of his institute. But then Rick Warren's people come in and start giving all these excuses. Well, that was just, that really wasn't much. And, and you have to be really careful. And all you can really do in the end is read that Bible and believe it. And just keep it in your heart. Because, you know, some of the stuff that I say is going to go flying past you. You know, you don't need to know all this stuff. But you need to know that they're trying to create a new spirituality, a new worldview. And they're going to try to convince you that this is something that's coming from God. And I really believe deeply that they're going to use quantum physics and science to make that quantum leap from the Bible story to this new story. And I think there's a reason quantum leap has crept into our vocabulary over the years. There was a book called The Tao of Physics by Fritz Kopra back in 1975. And the subtitle was something like Parallels Between Eastern Mysticism and the new physics. And a lot of us were aware of that book. It's leaching into the Christian faith. There are books that are about to break and come out on quantum physics and how the church needs to take a look at this. Maybe, you know, I mean, Teilhard de Chardin was a, a Jesuit mystic priest who was ostracized and defrocked by the Catholic Church. He, had a, he was like the father of the New Age movement. He said that God was in every atom. Now you have people like William Paul Young talking about subatomic particles, and you have fr the word fractal popping up in the shack a number of times, and it is introducing just ever so gently, just a little bit here, a little bit there. Oh, isn't that a good story? You know, it's, it's very emotional. And the word fractal is being put in there just the way Quantum Leap has been there over the years. 1 Timothy 6.20 he warns about babbling, which is pretty much what Schuller's doing. And he warns about science, falsely so-called. You know, it's unbelievable. The Bible, it's like, it's like a, as I said yesterday, it's like a Geiger counter. How about this one? I'm taught. Okay, here. In the Course of Miracles, this Jesus is asked if he's the Christ. He says, oh, yes. Oh, well, but he just passed the, te the test of the spirits, right? I mean, he said yes. Well, wait a second. No, he says, oh, yes, along with you. His little life on earth was not enough to teach the mighty lesson that he learned for all of you, which is that we are all God. We are, God is in everyone and everything. Can you understand why when I read in Rick Warren's book on page 88, when he used the new century version of the Bible and he said that God rules everything, is everywhere, and is in everything, that I just went, Oh, no, Lord, I, I, I have to write another book. You know, it was like, it was like, it was just clear. You cannot do that. Rick Warren, by the way, had introduced the word purpose and his whole purpose-driven framework by, by referring to Dr. Bernie Siegel, who's a New Age leader who has a spirit guide named George. Most people didn't know that. As a matter of fact, one of his own apologists in writing a critical article about me and my book actually said in his article, you know, I, I really didn't know that he was a, a new ager until I read Warren Smith's book. 
I mean, his own people didn't know. I don't know if Rick Warren knew or what was going on, but I'll know, I know one thing. Robert Schuller knew who Bernie Siegel was because Bernie Siegel endorsed Robert Schuller's 1995 book, Prayer. One of the arguments that came back from Saddleback on me was, hey, you know, Robert Schuller is, is not my mentor. I mean, it was an interview with one of his people. R Rick Warren said that. And the man that was brought forward was, was this man Criswell, who was a Baptist preacher in, I think, Texas. Well, what was so funny to me, not funny, but ironic, is that in that same book, just below Robert or uh, Bernie Siegel's endorsement of Robert Schuller's book was Criswell's, saying anything that anything that uh, that Robert Schuller writes is just great. So I'm thinking, well, you know, if he was Rick Warren's mentor and he thinks anything that Robert Schuller wrote, I mean, it's like there's a lot of double talk going on. There's a lot of defensive posturing that's going on in the church right now. There are denominations, there are denominations that aren't denominations that aren't standing up for the word of God. They're not doing the whole counsel of God. They're not warning about what's going on. They're not protecting the sheep. They're not protecting the flock. You know, I've been privileged to be around some pastors like the one in this church, John Higgins, Dwight Duvall, and, and, and others that are really standing up for the truth. And that's not to glorify these men. They just love the Bible and they, and they let the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance not give them a spiritual experience per se, but bring to remembrance the words of God. That's what we have to be brought to our remembrance, not a spiritual experience. They, they in the New Age, want us to have a spiritual experience. So you can imagine what it's like for me to be in this Course in Miracles that, that defines the crucifixion in this way. Jesus, quote unquote, Jesus, tells this woman, do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. It's put into The Course in Miracles, which is published in 1975, and in 1979, Gerald Jampolsky writes this book. It's given to me in a New Age massage class in the early 80s, and then I get The Course in Miracles. I'm at a bookstore, and I, I, I want to get The Course in Miracles. I pick it up, and I go, ah, oh, I see all this Christian terminology. It turns me off. When you're in a New Age, you know, and, and, you, and you've had maybe not a, a great church background. I was in a very liberal church. I, so I went to the counter and I said to the guy, I said, what do you think about the Course in Miracles? He said, oh man, he says, I've been doing it for 16 months, changed my life. So I go, oh, okay, I must be okay. So I accept all the new definitions. I start reading it and learning all these things that I'm quoting to you. The journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. The song of Easter is the glad refrain, the Son of God was never crucified. There's no sin. There's no devil. I mean, we know that, you know, the, the, the scriptures, uh, when they say there's no sin, you know, 1 John 1, eight. if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and, and the truth is not in us. You know, you can give a counter scripture for every one of these things. How about this one? The Jesus of A Course of Miracles said a slain Christ has no meaning. I mean, can you get much more blasphemous than that? Meanwhile, Marianne Williamson comes out with her book, A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. 1992, the year that my book, The Light That Was Dark, comes out, warning about A Course in Miracles. I'm kind of going, watch out for The Course in Miracles. You know, I'm, I mean, barely getting on some radio. Moody Press thinks the new age has gone away. And meanwhile, Marianne Williamson is brought on to Oprah. Oprah holds a return to love, reflections on the principles of the Course of Miracles, and says, this is one of the best books I have ever read. The philosophy in this book could change the world. You bet it, it, it will, and it can, but not in a good way, not in a biblical way. Then she tells the audience, I like this book so much, I bought a thousand copies, and I'm giving one out to everyone in the audience. As far as I can recall, I think this was the first book in Oprah's book club. It was an unofficial entry. It was never officially listed. The book soared to number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and the false Christ of the New Age was out of the closet and mainstreamed right there in 1992. Can you imagine what that's like to write a book warning about it? And they're on Oprah, and they're going wild, and I'm calling up radio stations saying, yeah, you know, I've, I've, got this, uh, I've got this book that talks about, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, 
it, it, Oprah's been recommending it. Oh, really? Okay, well, how about 3 o'clock next Tuesday? I mean, the only way I got on the radio is because Oprah. It was like the Oprah thing. It wasn't because they wanted truth. And these were Christian radio stations. But I did get the message out, and I think some people heard it. But <sighs> meanwhile, after September 11th, there's Marianne Williamson on Oprah saying, our way hasn't worked. Well, your way's never going to work, Marianne, but you're making it look like it's biblical Christianity, and that's not what she was, you know, she was bringing up the possibility of outing the New Age philosophy, which is we are all one. God is not only out there, he's in everyone, imminent in everyone, which is exactly what Robert Schuller said. Schuller even had the audacity to say that in the last three years, my faith has gotten broader richer and broader. Yes, God is alive and he is in every single human being. And meanwhile, you have someone like Lee Strobel, who has all these apologetic books, standing on the stage at, at Schuler's 2008 Rethink Conference, and everybody goes, well, you know, Lee Strobel, you know, I mean, he's got all these books on, you know, on, on apologetics. He knows what he's doing. I mean, well, maybe he's, somebody even told me, well, maybe he wanted to go there and, and proclaim the gospel. Come on, you know? You don't go to Robert Schuller's church and proclaim the gospel. What you're doing is you're giving Schuller credibility. They're basically trying to bring Schuller back into some kind of form where he will be able to be credible again. Because a lot of people know better. A lot of Christians, they go, oh, Robert Schuller. Yeah, well, he's still there. Last time I saw him when I was at another conference, he was on like three times on a Sunday morning, just before I even went to the conference. He had a guy on today that was uh, a cook. And he had a restaurant in Houston, and I guess he's got a book out. Real nice guy. And the guy gave a good testimony about the Lord, accepting the Lord. It was, I mean, it was, I had no reason to disbelieve anything. He was in uh, Ed Young's church. And, and Schuller really got that out there so that there's a pastor that could be kind of giving him a little bit of credibility. And then his guest for the day, I thought this was really ironic because yesterday I talked about fractals and quantum physics in the shack. He, his guest speaker was a man who was a physicist. And I went, oh boy, he's just gonna roll this whole thing out. This is unbelievable. Well, he didn't. He talked about philanthropy and led up to a, a, a little spot where Schuler asked for summer partnership. I mean, it was almost, it was like a biblical presentation to get into Schuler's come on for getting some money. But right towards the end, this man said, I got into philanthropy and started this whole organization when I got a phone call from John Marks Templeton, Jr. Well, John Marks Templeton's a philanthropist. Some of you may know the Templeton Fund. This is a guy who has tried to bring science and spirituality together. Dave Hunt exposed him as a heretical New Ager years ago in one of his books. I think it was The Seduction of Christianity. Maybe it was uh, one of his others, Occult Invasion. And John Marks Templeton, he has the Templeton Prize so this, this New Age sympathizer who has an agenda to have science prove that God is in everything has a Templeton Prize and it's been awarded, I think, half of the last 15 years it's gone to physicists. <laughs> and when Rick Warren agreed to be one of the judges on the Power of Purpose essay contest, a lot of people went, wait a second, what's he, what's he doing? What's Rick Warren doing? Well, he just did it. <laughs> they just kind of do what they want to do. And they're, they're not really, you know, you hear the word accountability a lot. One of the ways that this church, I'm calling it the establishment church, it's becoming, if it isn't already, it is the apostate church. One of the ways that it's happened is the same way the New Age did it. The New Age had all these little groups. You had Maharishi Mahesh Yogi with the Beatles going to India. You had the UFO people. You had the Course of Miracles. You had Shirley MacLaine. You had all these different things, est. They all looked like they were different, okay? Put them in a picture and just have them all separate. And then a couple of them get together, draw a line between the two of them. Okay, the years go by, boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden, it's all hooked up and you've got a picture. You've got a false Christ. Meanwhile, you've got the church over here and you've got Robert Schuller, you've got Purpose Driven, you've got all these different churches. They seem to be disconnected. Nobody's really over any of them. Now they're starting to link up. When, when something is linked up in a bad way, they kind of back off, hey, I'm not really with him. I mean, Rick Warren, when he's cornered with some of the people that he's identified with, I wouldn't want to be one of his friends because the, the friends bite the dust. I mean, they just they threw Schuler in a, in, the, in a trash heap on paper. But I always thought it was kind of more like, 
hey, Bob, uh, you know, we're getting a little bit of heat for being too close to you, but, you know, we'll meet you around the bend when we get a little bit more, get this thing out there a little bit more, but I'm sorry, we're going to have to publicly kind of make it look like we're not with you. I mean, Rick Warren's wife in Christianity Today said that Robert Schuller had a profound, that was her word, profound influence on her husband. Yet, Saddleback apologists come back and, and indicate that, no, uh, you know, that was a misunderstanding. That's been greatly misunderstood. What we're looking at, it reminds me of, uh, uh, I think it's James Carville. You know, I mean, Bill Clinton, you know, could have pickpocketed somebody, and Carville would have a reason. He'd say, no, that was really Bill Clinton's money that was in that guy's wallet, and he was just trying to get it or something. I mean, they have a reason for everything. What can you believe in this world that we live in? You can believe the words of Jesus Christ. You can believe the words of the, of the men in the Bible where the Holy Spirit spoke to them, all scripture is inspired by God. You have to be able to rightly divide it and to know what it is. But the, the whole mystique in the New Age is like, oh, well, they interpret it wrong. They don't, they don't have the metaphysical, the real interpretation. Hey, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's pretty straightforward. You know, I mean, there's not too much room for... Okay, how about this one? Matthew 24, 3 to 5. The disciples asked Jesus, when will you return... And when will the end of the world come? And he says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What did the Course of Miracles say? The name of Jesus Christ is such as but a symbol. It's a symbol that's safely used as a replacement for the many names of all the gods to which you pray. You are Christ. Oh, yes, along with you, you are Christ. Jesus just hit it right on the nose. I mean, I, I, I've said this many times. When I read that, I went, he's warning me about me. That was pretty humbling. That was pretty sobering. I'm the guy that he's warning me to watch out for. You know? I mean, but that doesn't really seem to... Uh, Robert Schuller said, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll never have to worry about the devil. Rick Warren says, it helps to know that Satan is entirely predictable. Well, that's real helpful. That's really protecting the flock. That's like a football coach saying, well, we've got, we got a team we're going to be playing next week, and they got some pretty good pass plays, but we're not going to watch any game films this week. You know, we're just going to fly into that game, and we're not going to worry about it because you know, we've got God on our side. Reminds me of the old Bob Dylan song, you know, with God on our side. You know, everybody's got God on their side, so how, they don't have to worry about anything. It's unbelievable. So you've got, in the church, you've got all these little different churches, but now, all of a sudden, after September 11th, things are really moving fast. The New Age moved into place. They're all over the place saying, hey, we need a new way. We need, this is a new world. We need a new way. Boy, Oprah had some high-powered shows. Wayne Dyer was on PBS, th that uh, public broadcasting station. They ran his show all day and all night, as I recall, in New Orleans when I was there writing this book. And he's saying, you know, the world's in trouble. And, uh, you know, I've been reading this really brilliant stuff. It's called A Course in Miracles. I'm going, oh, come on. What they want to do is they want to have a new way of doing life with a capital L. All of you, all of humanity are God, capital L, life, and all of ecology, the environment, all of that is God too. Romans makes it real clear that the creation is not a capital C like William Paul Young has it in his book 20 times. It, it's, it's a wonderful, I mean, the creation is beautiful. I mean, it, God created it, you know, and, and the, 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 the stereotype that's coming out is like, well, those, those Bible-believing fundamentalists, they just think that the world's coming to an end, so they don't care about the environment. Go ahead, blow it up, who cares? And these are, you know, I'm hearing some of this thing from the emergent leaders. What a stereotype. What an incredible stereotype. Talk about judgment. You know, they just throw everybody into a big heap if they happen to believe in a literal Bible. So there's a lot of misinformation that's going out. But now we're seeing, like, all these emergent guys just, you know, by the way, David Spangler, New Age leader at Findhorn in Scotland, been around for years, still is around. He, he, uh, he's got so many ways of describing things that fall in line exactly with 
the, the emerging people. He actually had a book called Emergence. The false Christ talks about his emergence. Alice Bailey talks about the emerging God, emerging emergence. Barbara Marks Hubbard, who talks about the selection process, has a book called Emergence. They've got the emerging church. It's kind of like Eugene Peterson putting as above, so below in the middle of the Lord's Prayer. Like, talk about an unholy spirit influencing people. So the emerging church, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I'm not with Dan Kimball, but he's not emergent. And, oh, the term emergent doesn't really mean anything anymore. It's mumbo-jumbo. These guys are hooking up in different ways. And unfortunately, if you track Rick Warren, he's got endorsements on just about all their books. But uh, he endorsed a book by emerging leader Dan Kimball, his book about the emerging church. And it's, it's co endorsed and there are comments by Brian McLaren who's one of the most outrageous you know violators of scripture that's out there today and yet Rick Warren says well I didn't know Brian McLaren was going to be in that book you know I mean there's always some kind of an excuse and unfortunately most people just go oh okay I understand so all you can really do is go back to scripture I was reading through I, I think a lot of Christians think that um, the New Age is Shirley MacLaine running down the beach shouting, I am God, and, you know, she was the butt of uh, late-night talk show jokes, you know, and she took the hit. But you know what? It's, it's all there. And I was reading through her book, Out on a Limb, which is the one that the movie was made, the TV movie was made out on. I couldn't believe it. I, these are notes that I just, I just made the other day. Uh, I copied them real quick and didn't read them. She talks about science and there's a Mayan spirit guy that says science is ultimately going to prove, you know, things that are going to change the way people think. Have you ever noticed in the bookstores now, there's a lot of stuff about 2012, 2012. I mean, it's getting bigger and bigger. When I was in the uh, bookstore at the airport, the, the Christian inspiration rack, so-called Christian inspiration rack, had a book about 2012, and it had, the author was uh, Greg Braden, and it was called fractal time. Well, there's that word fractal right out of a shack. And there, how did Greg Braden's book, I mean, not that that Christian rack was, I mean, it wasn't that it was the most biblical thing in the world, but, it, but at least it purported to be Christian. All of a sudden, there's that book. This has been going on for years. So these, this picture, these different groups are hooking up. The lines are hooking up. And what's happening now is you've got, like, Robert Shuler's supposed to be over here, but it's like, line over here to Gerald Jampolsky in The Course in Miracles. These, th this picture is hooking up with this picture, and you're going to get an even bigger picture. And it's going to be the false Christ. And it's going to happen in ways that, I mean, we've been watching how quickly this thing's been developing. And I've also noticed that there's a lot of confidence on the part of those in the emerging church. I find it interesting that you know, they're, they're doing some, some good works, no doubt. But the attitude is kind, of, it's kind of flip. It's kind of arrogant. It's almost as if Christians never did anything before the emerging church went out and helped the homeless or Rick Warren got his peace plan. It's kind of like nobody ever really did anything before they came on the scene. There's a certain kind of arrogance and impudence that kind of betrays a little bit of where they're really at. I think there's a fair amount of pride involved. Neil Donald Walsh is another, Marian Williamson is, is, is one of the big people right now. As a matter of fact, Marian Williamson and Neil Donald Walsh, who was suicidal, railing out against God, much in the way that William Young was in the shack, all of a sudden, he hears this voice that basically says, do you really want to know me or are you just venting? And everybody goes, oh, 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 oh that's kind of cute. And then he goes into this conversation with God that turns into a series of now probably at least four or five books where he's literally portraying this conversation that he had with God. What does he say? He says, you are God. This, his God says, you are God. That God is in everything. That we're all one. The same thing. What I noticed when I was writing Reinventing Jesus Christ back right after September 11th, it was really something to be writing this book in the shadow of September 11th with all these people pouring onto television. And what I found out is that what Marianne Williamson was saying was what Shirley MacLaine was saying, which is what Neil Donald Walsh was saying, which was what Maitreya was saying. And who's Maitreya? He's saying that he's Christ. He's here in physical form on earth. And he came here, I think it was in 1979, he said he came in an airplane. 
You know, he came in the air. They're using that little counterfeit thing. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Well, he came in the air on an airplane, and every eye will see him when he makes his declaration. Well, they'll see him on TV, so every eye will see him. Counterfeit, counterfeit, counterfeit. Holy Spirit, unholy spirit. But what I noticed, and it really, it really shocked me, was that all these guys were saying the same thing. The New Age philosophy was completely unified. It was completely coherent. And they have different manifestations once you get outside the inner circle. But the inner circle is we are all one because God is in everyone and everything, including the earth. The shack has Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God all planted in physical form on this earth, setting up the same kind of bridge to Christ already being here. Am I saying that Maitreya is the, is the Antichrist? No, but I'm saying it's really interesting to me that he's been here for like 1982. There were newspaper ads taken out all around the world. The Christ is here. He is, he is you know, Jesus Christ to the Christians. He's, he's um, the fulfillment of all the other religions. You know, he's uh, Maitreya to the Buddhists. You know, he's the uh, Imam Mahdi to, to Muslims. He's going to be all things to all people. Well, guess what? If the Christ is in everyone and he is the head, then Jesus can just be kind of like who they're saying he was, which is the first one to recognize the Christ principle within himself and therefore was a way shower to everyone else, then he's just another Christ. I mean, it's pretty slick. When you talk about the wiles of the devil, I mean, I remember I was a brand new Christian. And I was in a church, and I, had, I was working with developmentally disabled. I've been a social worker my whole life. I was working with developmentally disabled, and I was trying to interest churches in starting ministries with the developmentally disabled. The Lord used it because I talked to every pastor in my hometown right after I got saved, and I was shocked. I'd go home at night, and I'd say, Joy, I don't think these guys get it. I don't, I don't think they know there's a battle going on. I mean, that's why this present darkness, when that book came in, that novel, it was encouraging. When Dave Hunt's book, The Seduction of Christianity, and T.A. McMahon's book came out, The Seduction of Christianity, we bought a case of them. I called, you could still get Dave Hunt on the telephone. I called him up, got a case, handed them out to everybody in our church. It's like the whole counsel of God. We just came out of all this. Now I'm watching the church go into the very thing that I left. And what's interesting to me is they're more concerned about those of us who are critiquing them than they are about these people who are blaspheming Jesus. That's the, to me, that's the sign of the times. The fact that Robert Schuller's there, that Rick Warren cares more about people who are critiquing him. Of course, he says he doesn't care about his critics. He says he listens to his critics. But meanwhile, he's got somebody out there who's doing a very good job of trying to systematically tear down anyone who says anything in the way of questioning Rick Warren. It's pretty wild. Neil Donald Walsh was one of those that heard the voice of God, quote-unquote God, and did all these teachings, conversations with God. When I was a hospice social worker in uh, Central California, I was in a house. Uh, the patient was uh, very close to death. Um, the, the husband's parents were there, and the husband's parents were from my hometown on the East Coast. And I started talking to them. They were just this real kind of like, you know, they could, they could fit right in here in Clorinda. I mean, this... And we start talking, and he goes, yeah, yeah, we're, we're hoping that, you know, God will really be with, you know, her. And I said, oh, I'm really glad to hear that. He goes, yeah, we just read Neil Donald Walsh's book, and we sure love all of his stuff. And I said, where'd you go to church? And they named the church, and it was just like the one that I went to when I was a kid. You know, you just don't get it. It's just kind of, it was congregational. I think it's United Church of Christ now. So in the late 1990s, Neil Donald Walsh and Marianne Williamson formed a group of New Age leaders called the Global Renaissance Alliance. Global Renaissance Alliance. In, in 2005, that morphed into the Peace, the, the Peace Alliance, and Neil Donald Walsh dropped off because a whole lot of us had tried to you know, explain to people that this guy's, you know, he, he's having these conversations with God, and it completely contradicts the Bible. And, Oprah had actually flown him. This was interesting because somebody went to this conference with Neil Donald Walsh uh, that was, you know, a believer. I just wanted to see what was going on because it was an open invitation. Anybody that wanted to come. And in one of his workshops, Neil Donald Walsh said, Oprah flew me to Chicago, held conversations with God up in the air and said, this is one of my favorite books. And she went on later to call Neil Donald Walsh one of the ten most memorable men, thinkers, that she'd, that she'd met. 
But Walsh, in his story, he said, he was so excited because he went, wow, I'm going to have zooming book sales with this. And the show didn't get aired. And months went by. So some of his people, you know, the ones that were, that liked Neil Donald Walsh, started emailing Oprah. And her people called him and said, Neil, you can't do that. It's not going to work. You've got to stop that. And we've looked at this program about eight times. You're just too far ahead of the curve. This is probably like, you know, the late 90s. You're too far ahead of the curve. People aren't ready for it yet. I think Neil Donald Walsh could probably go on there today and it wouldn't be any big deal. I know Oprah uh, interviewed Abraham, who is a spirit called the Source, that channeled through uh, this, this woman, uh, Esther Hicks, who has a book, who is actually inspirational in the book The Secret. And Oprah has gone so far now that she, on her radio program, she interviewed Abraham. In other words, she was talking to spirits. So if you're wondering why Oprah might be, I mean, pray for her. She, she, I think she's a sincere person. I think she probably loved Jesus as a little girl. But she's, I mean, she's become probably one of the chief false purveyors of this stuff, false teachers, false prophets. She's teaching it now. She did a, a seminar on the internet last year with Eckhart Tolle. And it was really interesting because Eckhart Tolle, by the way, is yet another New Age leader who says the Christ essence is in everyone. Before they started their seminar, they were they're doing these uh, Skypes, you know, where you can, you can see, you know, the person that you're talking to. And this, I, this lady was in uh, Illinois, I think. And so it was a setup question, no doubt in my mind. And she says, Oprah, you know, I've been, I've been reading Eckhart Tolle's books with fascination. And uh, I, I want to ask you, how do you reconcile what he's saying with, in my case, my Christian beliefs? And Oprah says, oh, well, earlier in the show, I talked about Eric, Eric Butterworth's book, Discover the Power Within You. And I knew that book. That book says that we're all divine. Over 100 times it talks about the divinity of man. And Oprah had actually introduced that book. That was last, that was like 2008. She's talking about Eric Butterworth. She did the same thing in 1997 on a show with Marilyn Ferguson who wrote The Aquarian Conspiracy. The Aquarian Conspiracy says there's a great heretical idea, God in everyone. And it takes a while for, for heretical ideas to take you know, to take form. But when they're widely communicated, they will eventually get through. Well, how about that? There's, there's Oprah in 1987 with Marilyn Ferguson. And on the show, Oprah says, you know, I read this book. It, was, it, it changed my whole way of looking at Jesus. Eric Butterworth's book, Discovering the Power Within You, taught me about the divinity of Jesus, that he was talking about our, uh, excuse me, about our divinity more than his divinity. He, Berterworth, was showing that we are all divine. And she said that on that show. She also had on that same show Kevin Ryerson, who was one of the channelers involved with Shirley MacLaine. So meanwhile, everybody's laughing at the movie in 1987 about Shirley MacLaine. Meanwhile, Oprah is going out to thousands, millions of people with all of this New Age stuff. The show was actually called The New Age Movement. There's a new movement going. Okay, well, when that stopped, it turned into the New Age, new spirituality, new spirituality, new gospel. We're turning it into the New World View. And the emerging church has become the merging church as it's moving in. And they'll, they'll say, no way, no way. But meanwhile, one of their authors was talking about martyrs. And there was a, he listed some famous martyrs. And I can't remember the guy's first name, but there was a martyr in Iraq, and his last name was Fox. He made a little mistake. He put Matthew Fox, and he really betrayed who he was really into. And I have no doubt that Math Matthew Fox was a, another Catholic priest who was defrocked. He's a Tehard de Chardin uh, guy who talks about God in every atom, you know, the I am of everybody, which is the I am God. In the New Age, we would meditate, and we would start our meditation, like at the Edgar Casey workshop I went to one time. We'd do Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God, total perversion of that scripture. It's not what was being said. God is making it clear that he was God. In that. So it just keeps getting flipped around, flipped upside down. And now, what was the Global Renaissance Alliance, once it was exposed, 
became the Peace Alliance, and there is now legislation in Congress for a peace department, which is going to have as its foundation the new spirituality and probably some of the hate stuff that's being, you know, the hate legislation has already moved through. It's probably already there, ready to be tweaked and redefined and, and used against anybody. Certainly what I, I'm exercising free speech right now, it won't be that long in the future. What, what I'm doing is going to be considered hate speech. It's not going to be considered nice to say anything about anybody else's religion. Even though, you look at, and, and some of the way this legislation may happen is because some of their people are being so kind of like nasty towards what we're saying, that they could actually help create the environment that would get the very thing that they want, which is to shut down the criticism. So Neil Donald Walsh, in a uh, fairly recent book, said the 21st century will be the time of awakening. That's one of the key words, awakening. It's a crossover word. It's one of those words where the lines go back and forth. We're being told by people like Rick Warren, there's a great awakening going on in the land. Thousands and millions are coming to Christ. It's just... It's not true. I mean, there's no great awakening happening. The awakening that Oprah and Eckhart Tolle talked about is awakening to the Christ within. You shift from the ego to the essence, the Christ essence that's within you. The word shift is at the heart of Bill Hybels' conferences every year. Awakening, shift, new paradigm, new worldview. It goes on and on. But there's no definition being given, no warnings being given. It's pretty remarkable how so many pastors in this land can just not care or not be aware. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's truly remarkable. And when Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind, that's exactly what's going on. But here's the bottom line. Jesus didn't say everyone's God, everyone's Christ, the broad way that R Robert Schuller is saying that you know, his faith had been broadened. Jesus said the way is narrow. And few there be that find it. And I think he probably would have maybe said few, that, few there be that stay with it, that stay the course, that stand when this stuff happens. I think a lot of people right now that are calling themselves Christians are going to be folding and just like flies into this thing because they, they're going to trust their pastor. Those that are head of big churches that aren't making a stand who aren't declaring what's going on, the whole counsel of God, are not fulfilling their role as, as a shepherd in, in protecting the flock. You cannot let this stuff, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I don't care how much good stuff there may have been weaved into the shack, the leaven that I described yesterday is enough to just completely expose it. And we talked about that. Dr. Harry Ironside said, a leaven, a truth mixed with error is the, is the worst of all. Because here, I, you know, I'm going for forgiveness in the Course of Miracles, and I've really learned to be more forgiving. I mean, I, I'll never forget, I was driving to Calistoga, there was a hot spring there, and there was this huge tractor trailer, and it was a really windy road going from, like, uh, the main highway into Calistoga, the back way in the Napa Valley, and I was getting kind of like, come on, man, I've got to get to the hot springs. And I went, wait a minute, my Course of Miracles lesson, you know, I've got I to gotta forgive this guy, you know, God's in him, and God's in me, and we're connected. And I really got into the whole forgiveness. And right as I got to the height of doing that, he beeped his horn and he waved me on. It was like, oh, wow. You know, I mean, it was like forgiveness being materialized right in front of my eyes. Forgiveness, you know, it's a wonderful concept, but not when you're forgiving people for not knowing that they're God. Atonement, atonement in the New Age is at one -ment. It's the same word, but it's at one -ment. As a matter of fact, listen to this definition in The Course in Miracles for atonement. Jesus, quote-unquote Jesus, another Jesus, the unholy Jesus, probably the master Jesus that Eugene Peterson has riddled through his book. Like John was saying last night, Lord Jesus Christ, you, you don't find it in, in, in the message. It's the master Jesus. And the interesting thing is that Maitreya said that when he appears as Christ, Maitreya the Christ, the master Jesus will be one of his masters of wisdom who will lead the Christian church in Rome, in their adoration and in their worship of the Christ. It's wild. Everything's turned upside down. But listen to this. The atonement is the final lesson he, man, need learn, for it teaches him that never having sinned, he has no need of salvation. 
And of course, the miracles has the audacity to say, my salvation comes from me. You're saved when you recognize that you're God. You, you shift from your ego to your essence. Meanwhile, there's a great awakening going on, and the word shift is everywhere. The new spirituality is just all over the emerging church, and somehow we're to believe that this is some new move of God. It's all there. It's all there in the New Testament, and I got it really clear in Johanna Michelson's book. But I also have to say, even after everything that happened that day in the bookstore, I still put the book back into the bookshelf because I was too proud to buy a Christian book. But after the next day, my wife had been, some of you know the story, my wife had been having this presence that was kind of manifesting around her. That's what our, our New Age journey was just wonderful until this thing happened, and we were beside ourselves. None of our New Age stuff worked. We repeated affirmations. You can repeat affirmations all day long, but if they're not true, <laughs> they're not going to do you any good. Even if you feel a little bit better, it doesn't, and they're still not true. You can't make something that's untrue true. And that's what they're trying to do, get you to affirm these things. So what I had read in Johanna Michelson's book, I thought maybe it would be a solution based on what I'd read, and I, and I addressed this presence, and I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you be gone. I forbid your presence here. I claim the blood of Jesus Christ upon us and go to where Jesus would send you, which is exactly what Johanna Michaels, and it was like whoosh, it was like gone, just like that. So there was a victory on the cross. Jesus Christ defeated evil, sin, death. And meanwhile, we're to believe that the journey to the cross is the last useless journey, and, and Brian McLaren's telling us that, that God would never do that. That's child abuse. You know, come on. And the shack, the shack is, the, the author of the shack is, is hedging around substitutionary atonement and getting cornered and doing kind of like both sides of the mouth stuff. Something very powerful happened. The love of God came to us. He manifested. The word was made flesh. He died for our sins. The big picture, the real big picture, the true picture, is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38. It's exactly what John was talking about this morning. That's the church. And we may need to just gather in, in each other's houses by the time this thing's done. Um, I would suggest that the underground church is already here. And I think that this is what we're feeling. And they can make fun of it. They can say whatever they want. But we're clinging to the truth they're going to be clinging to spiritual experiences. Spiritual experiences are being set up within the emerging church, and I think within the whole apostate church, where spiritual experiences, if you're not testing the spirits, if you're not checking, 1 John 4, 1, beloved, you know, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They're not testing them. People are going to start getting the same stuff that came to the New Age people, that came to us, they're going to think this is wonderful. I remember reading Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh books and getting the same hit that everybody's getting or a lot of people are getting when they read The Shack. The spirit world is quite capable of making you feel good about reading blasphemy. So what do we do? Well, we look up because our redemption, redemption draweth nigh. We work while it's still day because night is coming. And we stand and we do whatever we do to let people know and to warn people, and that's why hopefully yesterday there was enough information about the shack that when you have people that you know that are reading these things, you don't have to go into great detail. You just say, it's really dangerous. Let me, let me have a conversation with you. Did you know that the author said this, this, and this? So I would just like to thank you for having me. I, I think I say that on behalf of all the speakers. We're very grateful to come here. We love coming here. We all kind of joke about it. Hey, we're going to Clorinda. <laughs> and then usually there's something like, yeah, and the food's really good. So thanks, and uh, God bless all you guys.